An unmanned US drone crashes into the Black Sea after being pursued by Russian fighter jets. It's the most serious incident involving the two superpowers directly since the start of the Ukraine war. Is it just a one-off or a more serious escalation? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Russia and the US are presenting different versions of how a US surveillance drone ended up in the Black Sea. It came down on Tuesday after being pursued by Russian fighter jets near the Russian annex region of Crimea. The US Defence Department has released edited video taken by the MQ-9 Reaper drone. It shows a Russian Su-17 fighter jet approaching and dumping fuel as it passes. The U.S. says the unmanned drone's propeller was struck, forcing it down, and that it had been operating in international airspace. The Russian defense spokesman had a different version of what happened. On the morning of March 14, 2023, Russian Air Force control systems detected an American MQ-9 drone flying over the Black Sea near the Crimean Peninsula towards the Russian state border. The unmanned aircraft was flying with its transponders turned off and violated temporary restrictions to airspace usage set for the special military operation. Those restrictions were passed to all international airspace users and published in accordance with all norms. Fighter jets from the on-duty Air Defense Force were scrambled to identify the intruder. As a result of sharp maneuvering at around 9.30 Moscow time, the MQ-9 drone went into uncontrolled flight with a loss of altitude and collided with the surface of the water. I want to underline, Russian fighter jets did not use their onboard weapons, did not come into contact with the unmanned aerial vehicle, and returned safely to base. Well, close encounters between Russian and U.S. military aircraft are not uncommon, but this is the first time it's happened during the Ukraine war. Both sides were in contact immediately afterwards, seemingly to avoid an escalation. But publicly, there's been little sign of reconciliation. On Tuesday, Russian aircraft again engaged in dangerous and reckless and unprofessional behavior in the international airspace over the Black Sea. Two Russian jets dumped fuel on an unmanned U.S. MQ-9 aircraft conducting routine operations in international airspace. And one Russian jet struck our M MQ-9 aircraft, resulting in a crash. And this hazardous episode is, a part, is part of a pattern of aggressive, ris <clears throat> risky, and unsafe actions by Russian pilots in international airspace. You have heard representatives of the Pentagon and the Joint Chiefs of Staff say the United States will continue to fly wherever it pleases in accordance with international law. But if you follow this logic, then the space around the United States has the same status as the space over the Black Sea. Let's bring in our guests now. And in Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, defence and military analyst. In Portsmouth, Peter Lee, author of Reaper Force, Inside Britain's Drone Wars. And in Belfast, Alexander Titov, lecturer in modern European history at Queen's University, Belfast. A very warm welcome to all of you. Pavel, let's start with you because the US has just in the past hour or so before recording Inside Story, released a video of this incident over the Black Sea. The US is saying it proves their version of the events. What do you make of it? Uh, well, more, more or less, yes, it uh, apparently shows that uh, one of the blades of the propeller of the American uh, drone MQ-9 uh, was hit. It's deformed a bit, and that more or less shows you and that the Russian jets were flying very close, kind of skidding the uh, drone. Of course, there's a lot of, there's a difference in speed. Drones fly at much lower speed than jets on the speed that the drone flies uh, with its prop. A jet can't fly. It falls out of the sky. It has to fly far, far much quicker. And that means when they encounter, it's a kind of 
fly by on high speed, and that's dangerous. And apparently, there was a small mistake in the piloting by the Russian uh, pilot, and there was a minor collision. The American drone it didn't disintegrate; it disintegrated when it hit the uh, water. Uh, but it was uh, they couldn't fly home. The Russian plane did fly home, so. No lives were lost. That's uh, the good news. Mm. Uh, Peter, the U.S. says it was reckless, it was unprofessional. Do you also think, as Pavel says, that it was a mistake? Yes, I think it was probably a deliberate act to get as close as possible to the, to the Reaper drone. It's also reported that fuel was dumped on the drone. That is, that is quite, quite possible as well. And perhaps the Russian pilots thought if they flew close enough to the, to the Reaper, that the, the backwash, the jet wash from the engine would be enough to throw the, the Reaper into uh, some kind of uh, maneuver which would either down it or at least disturb its, its trajectory. So I think there was probably a miscalculation in going so close that eventually the, the Russian aircraft hit the propeller. And it, the propellers are very fragile at that speed. They're easy to damage. A large bird would damage the propeller and possibly destroy it. So it does not need a great amount of contact in order to render the, the propeller uh, dysfunctional. Alex, if, if indeed there was a minor collision there between the jet and the drone, what impact might that have had on the jet? Uh, well, difficult to say. Obviously, the jet has returned to the base and the, there's been no crash. Uh, from what I've read, you know, it's all very touch and go. A uh, few uh, centimeters uh, either, either way, it you know, could have uh, damaged uh, itself more. The jet could have damaged itself more than it damaged the drone. So, uh, yeah, very high risk for both for the pilot. And of course, um, there was a pilot in Russia and jet. Uh, unlike in the American one. So, yeah, this it seems to be very kind of high risk um, maneuver, probably not totally intended. But I think what we can clearly say is that there was uh, intention to intercept that drone to give a message to be kind of be, be quite aggressive around it, not necessarily to uh, bring it down, but certainly to um, <clears throat> uh, to interfere with its uh, path um, of, uh, of flight. So uh, I guess for the Russians, uh, as long as the, their own plane is not uh, damaged or uh, anything like that, that was a bonus that the whole thing came down and became kind of quite a big event in, mm. you know, between Russia and the United States. So and, and, the, and the Russians, because they wanted to send a message, they certainly did that. Yeah, they certainly did. I think it's important to mention we haven't so far that this, it wasn't just two flybys that we saw. This was going on for between 30 to 40 minutes, according to the US. It seems like quite a deliberate action. Would you agree, Peter? Yes, these kind of Russian actions with fast jet and other aircraft have gone on for generations. It's a Cold War tactic. Mm. So right up to the present day, and in fact, this last day or so near Estonia, Russia, Russian forces use, uh, use aircraft to probe um, the, the, the airspace of other countries, either violating the airspace or flying very close to the airspace to see how long it will take for a response to test what reaction will happen. So this is part of an ongoing culture that the, that the Russian Air Force has of testing an opponent's and adversary's um, speed of response, level of response, willingness to respond, to respond. So all of these factors will come into into consideration, and it, it is a bonus that the Reaper went down. But for the Russian aircraft itself, the underside of a fast jet is actually very strong. That's where you have to have the the support for the landing gear. If you're hanging weapons underneath, it has to be incredibly strong. So I would expect structurally there, there would be a little damage and perhaps a little bit of surface damage to the underside of the Russian aircraft. OK. Pavel, what was the message, do you think, that Russia was trying to send to the US through this incident? Well, like in previous uh, some encounters uh, with uh, uh, NATO ships and uh, uh, planes over the Black Sea, the Russians were kind of harassing uh, those who they believe are going too close mm. to Crimea, in particular, and uh, in the hopes that they will turn around and go home. Russia does not want their 
of uh, American and there's also, of course, British and French uh, recon planes, also piloted planes, big ones like the Poseidon, uh, flying in the, uh, over those waters. And so they don't want them there. And they want to send a message that they could be harassed and that the, this would put pressure on the pilots and on the command to turn around and go home. Mm. That's what they apparently were trying to do. That's why for a long time they were overflying the uh, intercepted uh, uh drone to, pr pressure, uh, to pressurize the pilot who was piloting it, of course, uh, 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 remotely, to turn around and go home. And this went a, went a bit wrong because there was a minor collision. And that's very dangerous because a fighter plane costs much more than this, not than the Raper drone, which is not basically the cutting edge of the newest American drone. And of course, there's a pilot on mm. board, and training a pilot takes, well, a decade, a good pilot. Mm. I mean, and they were in risk. And they could have been lost, and that would have been uh, well. So I don't believe that this was a deliberate ramming. Okay. This was a mistake, an accident. Okay, Alex, I can see you wanted to jump in there. Well, I think yeah, I think there's, you, you need to uh, also bear in mind that the statement by the, uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense saying that the, the drone was flying in uh, what it declared to be an uh, <clears throat> exclusive zone. Uh, special, uh, exclusive for these special military operations. So basically, what they're trying to do. So there's a international. It's it's very kind of conf, uh, confusing and also potentially dangerous clash because of course uh, Russia claims Crimea as its own. It's not recognized by the United mm -hmm. States. So technically, you know, United States go by the letter of law. It can fly, uh, fly over Crimea because it's Ukrainian territory as far as the Americans are concerned. But they're not doing that. So they're trying into kind of completely. Uh, 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 international um, uh, waters, but at the same time, Russians sort of trying to ex expand the exclusion zone uh, and sending a message to United, the, uh, to United States and the Allies that uh, <clears throat> that um, they are uh, uh, kind of serious about um, uh, uh, maintaining it. So uh, I would imagine that apart from actually what happened, you know, you will really have this issue of. Uh, further potential for escalation between Russia and United States. This is the, why it's important is because it's the first time there's a direct clash between American um, military and the Russian military, even if it wasn't uh, <clears throat> uh, manned. So, uh, so it's just a reminder that uh, this is a very precarious circumstances and there is a potential for further escalation if both ch sides um, uh, make a, a decision to, to go for it. Mm. So Pavel, far, it's it seems just a second, to be the, I see that Pavel was, was, was disagreeing with, with something there. So let me just bring him in and to bring your point forward. Uh, well, it was not really a clash because weapons systems were not used by any side. So it's not yet a clash. It's an accident. A clash Peter. could happen. Yes, this was a dry run. Okay. We, um, we've, got the, we've got the there, two sides here. We've got that it's an accident and that it was a crash. Peter, what, what's your thought? No, I mean, this was not a, I, a I clash to... between because it was, weapons were not used. Right. Okay. Uh, but weapons could be used. There could be American or British uh, recon planes flying in the same area with fighter escort. And that actually had, has already happened. And so we could see a clash between fighters of both sides. Well, that's it's an indication of, of what that, can that's the happen, bad news, isn't it? What can happen uh, in the future? Absolutely. Okay, Peter. In any of these confrontations, there there are interests um, happening at multiple levels at the same time. I actually think the the more interesting and possibly the most important part of this is not the physical. Um, contact between two aircraft and the downing of the, the Reaper drone. I think possibly the most interesting and relevant aspect is the clash between the way that the US is interpreting international law mm. and the way Russia is interpreting and trying to apply international law. Russia is declaring a, an area of special military operations, but, but that does not hold um, legal strength in the same way as the historical right to to fly in international um, airspace above international waters, so within 12 nautical miles of the coast uh, of, of, a, of a sovereign state. So we see Russia trying to exert this right to declare a, an area of special interest, and the United States making a, a concerted effort to deny that right 
and to keep on exerting the, the established norms in international waters to fly over the waters, to sail ships in the waters. And, and it's the same kind of work that the, the United States is doing in the Far East, where, where it is denying um, China's claim to, to parts of the South China Sea. So the United States, as well as its, its um, operations and its interest in the Ukraine-Russia war, it, it also has a global interest in keeping open the waters of the mm. world for, for ships, for civilian ships, for military ships to use as long as they're in international waters. Which suggests, Alex, that we might see the US continue to fly drones in this area, particularly to make the point that it does not recognize Crimea as Russian. Well, they certainly will keep flying drones. Mm. And, and with, the, with the United States um, defense budget, this is, it, it can be treated as a disposable item. Mm. Uh, and, and I think for the US to be able to produce the, the video footage from, from the drone itself, that is a, it's a, a bit of a psychological and political and operational uh, coup for the United States. They can actually demonstrate that the, 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 the Russian aircraft was certainly flying in an unsafe, unsafe manner for the pilot, never mind the drone, and that Russia was, was in the United States' eyes, breaching international law. I think they were breaching international law. Mm. Uh, but that is obviously going to be disputed um, by, by the, the, the Russian leadership. OK, Alex. Well, I think uh, there is obviously um, um, that dimension, uh, freedom of navigation and whatnot. But, you know, with this uh, drone flights, of course, they are gathering intelligence, which they're passing to Ukrainians mm. so they can use against Russian forces. So there is a kind of quite substantial and important dimension. Russians have been extremely annoyed and um, uh, worried about the amount of um, intelligence uh, gathered by drones like that, by the satellites and so forth, which is being uh, used by Ukraine to attack Russia in Crimea, including in Crimea. And uh, that's kind of full of discussions on, in Russian channels and so forth that, you know, every time there is an um, attack on the Russian um, bases in Crimea, there is a heightened activity of uh, surveillance drones by NATO, including America, Britain and, um, and others, flying around um, uh, identifying targets and uh, looking for what uh, the, the impact uh, was. So uh, there is kind of quite a substantial element on top of the, all this general discussion of freedom of navigation. And uh, it certainly is uh, not, not a comfortable position to be that, you know, you, you want to keep going, uh, our Russians want to send their message, Americans mm. want to send their message, mm. and at some point, you know, you have you keep escalating, and that's 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 the um, uh, the path we uh, seem to be on now uh, heading towards. And just one point, Pavel, if the tables were turned and the Russians, if, when, they fly near the United States, fly similar surveillance drones near the United States, would one expect to see a similar reaction? Uh, well, that's impossible because Russia doesn't have drones that can fly near the United States. Right. So, but Russian planes do fly, especially if they're close to Alaska and down the Alaskan coast towards California. But these are piloted planes, and quite often these are strategic nuclear bombers that fly there, sometimes with escort of uh, uh, fighters. They're intercepted by American fighters from Alaska. Mm. That happens also, of course, Russian uh, planes fly over the North Sea, Norwegian Sea towards Britain. Uh, the, but again, these are piloted planes. So they are, uh, they are intercepted, but uh, the Western uh, fighters don't go anywhere close okay. to have a collision. Peter, I because, just so to... there, the threat of a collision, of a mistake, is much higher because we're talking about uh, nuclear powered, maybe even nuclear carrying uh, uh, strategic bombers, and not just a, a raper drone. Because Russia Except does not haven't. have drones that can fly long distances. Right. OK. Peter, I just want to touch on a point that um, was raised in our discussion about this program earlier today. Why are these surveillance drones used at all when satellites can give perhaps just as good readings and are with, you know, will not be encountered by Russian jets. Why, why are the drones in particular being used there? Well, the drones are, are used for a number of reasons. Firstly, the, the, the cameras, the most well-known is called the Gorgon Stair, which can be 
can provide very high definition footage of of what's happening on the ground mm. and they can they can zoom in on a, a very particular point they, they're manually controlled whereas satellites um if a satellite is in orbit and it's moving around the earth you might not get the satellite exactly over the place that you want it to be looking at depending on the type of satellite and so if you have a drone it can it can be used in a much more um, I say targeted, but very precise way to, to look at a bit of activity or a bit of ground or something like that. Or it may be that the satellite will give one angle looking at a particular um, situation and a drone can give you a second um, a second visual angle. So the combination of the two can give you a richer richer information. So there are, there are a number of reasons why drones are, are particularly helpful in this situation. Okay. Alex, this drone, particular drone, has been lost at sea. We, we had both Russia and the US saying that they are now looking for it. How valuable would it be if indeed it's even found? Um, well, um, it's, I think it would be kind of quite a big coup for Russia in terms of um, getting their hands on um, uh, on actual piece of U.S. equipment, and I think the Russians are the only ones who are actually able to uh, retrieve it because American uh, ships are not allowed to through the Dardanelles mm. on the Monroe Doctrine. Um, but um, the I, sorry, I just want to kind of uh, mention uh, we're talking about drones and satellites. We didn't mention the balloons, and of course, if you mm -hmm. want to look at reaction, what Americans would feel like if the Russian just flying 20 nautical miles off uh, New York, whatever, you know, look at the all the um, uh, you know, panic around the Chinese mm. uh, balloon, which uh, flew over the United States. So, yeah, it's all very kind of touchy. I mean, it's there's a lot of symbolism in all those things, uh, in terms, including into retrieval, uh, including into the, um, you know, areas of exclusion and so forth, uh, which uh, either sides try to claim over themselves. So, um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, this is uh, for, for Russia. It's uh, so, so happened. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a big, um, big coup, and if they can get their hands on the actual uh, hardware from from the bottom of the sea, which they s s claim now they have located where it's fell, uh, fell, fell uh, down, uh, then it will be an extra extra bonus on top of the uh, or everything else that's happened. Mm. Pavel, the Kremlin spokesman has said that this has caused relations between the U.S. and Russia to hit quote their lowest point. That's quite a statement, isn't it? In a history of of roller coaster, shall I say, emotions between the two sides. Do you agree with it? Well, the relations are very bad, and that's not news. I mean, that was said many times by the uh, Dmitry Peskov, the uh, Putin's uh, press spokesman and press secretary and <clears throat> deputy chief of his administration. Uh, so this is not, things didn't get that much worse, but they, of course, didn't get better. There's been acrimonious exchanges. The good news is that there were, uh, yes, uh, there were talks, uh, telephone talks mm. between uh, defense ministers and between uh, the chief of general staff, uh, Valery Gerasimov, and the American uh, chairman of Joint Chiefs. So that's the good news, that there was high-level contact to try to de-escalate and not to kind of have such incidents in the future. And if uh, we have to see with how effective that de-escalation is going to be. So not, that, not all bad happened, some good happened too. Yeah. Uh, and gathering the force that drone, Russia would try, but not much I think it would get. Uh, some of the, uh, it, it disintegrated when hitting the uh, sea uh, surface, some floating pieces of the plastic uh, outer co uh, cover of the drone may be floating around, something can be found, but finding a, uh, from about two kilometers deep, and that's apparently where it went down, more than 100 kilometers off Crimea, well, that would need equipment that Russia has, but it doesn't maybe have it in the Black Sea, and bringing mm. it in, say, from the Barents Sea, but uh, that's right now, with the, again, with the closed uh, Bosphorus, is a bit of a problem. Peter, how provocative do you think this incident has been? I mean, it does seem that neither side is particularly interested in, interested in escalating it at this stage. But now that the US has released this video, do you think that changes the tone somewhat? I think it will... I think that will be part of de-escalating because it, it's quite hard for the Russian ministry to continue to, to state a position that is demonstrably 
wrong, you know, that, that is factually wrong. But also, I think the the heat and pressure of the war that's ongoing at the moment between Russia and Ukraine adds to the tension. But I think it's not anywhere near the lowest point mm. that, that Russia or the, or the former Soviet Union, as it was, has reached with the United States. Uh, memories are very short, but even looking back a few decades to Afghanistan in the, in the 1980s, when when the, the the Mujahideen at that time were being supplied by vast numbers of American shoulder-held anti-aircraft missiles, and they were shooting down hundreds and hundreds of of Soviet Union aircraft and helicopters. So there have been tensions much more, um, much greater than we're seeing at the moment. It's just that the immediate problem is usually the one which people concentrate on. But actually, if you go back a bit further in history, and that's before you even get to the nuclear tension over mm. Cuba. So there, there are lots of examples in the past of, I think, much, much bigger tensions than now. I think bigger risks than now. But this is this is an, in an age of 24-hour scrolling news and, and much more... Um, uh, much more footage is available. So I think the, 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 the context now is not as serious as, as presented. And I think it will, it will slowly quieten down over the mm. next few days. I think both sides want to do that. And then they'll probably ramp up some activities okay. elsewhere. Indeed. Uh, Alex, the last word to you. Would, you. would you broadly agree with that? Do you think we're going to see more incidents like this that are going to flare up these tensions once again? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, this is quite dangerous, and I think it's more um, dangerous than, than Afghanistan because uh, the Americans are providing way more advanced heavier weapons. Uh, there is a path to, uh, than they ever done before anywhere else against directly against Russians. You know, uh, the uh, the path that was further sending of heavy weapons, including tanks. You know, that kind of thing was unimaginable in Afghanistan. Uh, and also, of course, you have uh, ability of those weapons to be used against what Russia says its own territory, particularly Crimea, but not only. Uh, so I think there is a path towards, towards escalation is quite uh, much more serious than it's been uh, in the past, apart perhaps from the Caribbean. Uh, um, <clears throat> a crisis, but uh, yeah, no, I think I think it's it, it really is. Uh, both uh, sides are staking claims. Mm. Uh, if um, um, not, none uh, of the uh, signals from each side are being kind of heeded and they kind of reestablish some lights, what they're trying to do now is basically reestablish new rules of the game because the game is is new one. Uh, if uh, they uh, both sides ignore them, then I think we can can see. Uh, for the potential, but the calls from uh, the Secretary of Defense to the Russian Minister of Defense and from Joint, uh, Chief of Joint uh, Staff uh, to the uh, to Gerasimov, uh, his counterpart in Moscow, suggest that both sides actually, particularly Americans, actually want to play it down and not to okay. escalate it further. Okay. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. Pavel Felgenhauer, Peter Lee, and Alexander Titov. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.